Hi folks, welcome to another edition of the Ominist Hour. That ominous music, I believe, was uh, Alban Berg, one of the uh, early experimenters in uh, program music, 12-tone, uh, the music of the early 20th century classical. Uh, actually, the part of it I'm not that fond of. And uh, that kind of ushers in the topic for today's uh, lesson, if you will. Um, let's talk about the background picture. Let me get out of the way a little bit so you can see. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the movie uh, Mars Attacks will see, will recognize one of the aliens in uh, human disguise whose head has just exploded because they heard the strains of uh, I can't remember the name of the old uh, country crooner that the old like the old grandma liked to listen to that turned out to explode the uh, Martians' heads, but that that very closely relates to today's topic. Okay, so without further ado, let's uh, let's read you what I'm titling this one. Um, I'm going to call this episode "Satan's of Sound." The Dark Messiahs of Misanthrope Music. Okay, so where are we going with that? Um, most of you probably have fairly strong taste in music. Um, and uh, to a large extent, at least by my observation, that taste tends to have a very strong generational cultural element. Now, uh, if you uh, have followed my channel for a while or know much about my tastes, uh, you'll know that I was born in uh, 1959, uh, just before uh, the major madness that was created by the Kennedy assassination happened and just after the madness of uh, uh, the beginning of the Cold War. Um, and uh, so I had uh, a musical exposure that had influences uh, commensurate with that time. Uh, now, if you know that time, you know that that was the transition between kind of the uh, Elvis generation of rock and roll to the Beatles generation um, and from you know kind of the Frank Sinatra crooner era to the uh, uh, what would you call it the, the Madonna era of you know sort of the, the more female directed pop music now, my influences included uh, a pretty broad range. Uh, the two most influential people in my musical training were my oldest brother, Peter, who uh, had taken an interest in classical music and had taken up the violin, and who was uh, kind of my cultural mentor in early years. Uh, and my dad, who uh, had been a trumpet player uh, in his younger years, uh, playing more uh, kind of swing jazz music, but had gravitated towards country music uh, by the time I became his son, and uh, pretty much played country music nonstop when I was a kid, which drove me crazy. I didn't like country music at the time. Uh, not because it wasn't some of it good, and uh, those who know me, who listen to my karaoke shows on Star Maker, uh, know that I sing quite a bit of country music now. In fact, uh, the memories of doing karaoke with my dad, who had one of the worst voices I think I've ever heard, but loved to sing with his favorite old tunes. Uh, that's one of my best memories of my dad and me enjoying time together before he died that in uh, 2008. At any rate, music is a hugely important piece of almost everybody's life and uh, generally a very spiritual piece. 
Um, and in fact, many of the people will, uh, many people will choose a particular church, if they're Christian, based upon the music, not based upon necessarily what their beliefs are or their dogma is. And uh, that was a large part of the rise of the so-called mega churches, uh, the born again mega churches, non-denominational churches, which are uh, something I didn't like very much either. I don't like their brand of religious music. It's kind of more pandering to pop taste than trying to bring them to a wider understanding of uh, spirituality, in my humble opinion. Uh, now, this is a topic that we can argue over, and we will probably argue over. Most of the younger people, uh, their musical taste is centered on uh, neo-pop, the Britney Spears kind of junk. Yes, it is junk as far as I'm concerned, complete trash or rap in its updated conversion to uh, try to legitimize itself by no longer being the language of uh, gangbangers and, and uh, counterculture uh, society destroyers. That's basically what rap looked like to me when it came on the scene. It was a very dark influence on America. And uh, I'm sure somebody will want to argue with me about that and say, no, it was opening us up and awakening us and, and pointing out the injustice of blah, 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 blah. Okay, <laughs> I'm more than happy to take flat <coughs> along those lines. Uh, what I want you to know is that there is not universal taste in music. And your taste in music is going to be largely a function of the culture you were brought up in and your level of consciousness. Now, some people born into modern culture, uh, for instance, folks like my children, have uh, more eclectic interests. My son likes rap, my oldest son. He also likes classical. He also likes show tunes. He also likes a lot of music, unlike most of his contemporaries who are kind of narrow-mindedly, this is what I listen to, and they have their favorite playlist, and uh, they blindly follow that. Um, You've got uh, so-called spiritual people who are all into these binaural beats and, uh, you know, shamanic champ music or whatever these guys get into and they think that's the, that's the bee's knees as far as music is concerned. I listen to a bit of that, you know, trying to be <coughs> open-minded to uh, others uh, suggestions on what to listen to when you were going through an awakening and I found it did not speak to me in one bit not even this much of a fraction compared to how uh, my favorite spiritual music which I think I have to say is Mahler Gustav Mahler Jewish, converted Christian, uh, late romantic, some might, might classify him as neo-romantic, who uh, in between a very busy conducting career that uh, moved from Europe to the US uh, right around the, the, period, the World War II period, uh, managed to compose uh, nine complete symphonies and one unfinished symphony and is one of the uh, great composers who uh, fed, feed this myth that uh, if you try to outdo Beethoven you're in for trouble. Uh, those of you familiar with Schubert and his unfinished uh, 
he actually, his main unfinished symphony was his eighth. He left that one unfinished and thought, well, I'm going to do the ninth and then call it the eighth and then finish the eighth and that will break the curse. Didn't. Uh, he, left, he finished the ninth and left the eighth unfinished and then died. Uh, so there's, there's kind of a weird, weird sort of a synchronicity going there with symphonic composers which actually was broken by Shostakovich, who ended up turning in, I think, about 15 symphonies before uh, the Soviets finally uh, offed him. Did they off him? I don't know. They silenced him. He was, he was very much tortured by uh, the World War II period, uh, going from being uh, kind of the darling of the war movement uh, with his early symphonies to being a pariah uh, under these post-war symphonies. And unlike Prokofiev, he didn't escape. Prokofiev escaped to France and became quite famous uh, composing uh, neoclassical music, which was the most popular of the different directions classical music was going at, a t at that time. Um, what I'm getting at is music is a hugely spiritual thing. And one of the things that illustrates how individual spirituality is. We are not all one. Anybody who tells you that, just ask them what their favorite music is. And then tell them what your favorite music is. And unless you're you know, on the same wavelength and in the same echo chamber, you're going to have a difference there. And it's one of the best ways to deal with people who are dogmatic. You ask them what their favorite music is. Well, I'm a Christian. I only like Christian music. Okay, are you familiar with Faure's Requiem? Are you familiar with... Uh, Box B minor mass. Are you familiar with Mozart's uh, masses? Handel's oratorios. They say, no, I don't like that classical shit. I like real Christian music. Okay. You can divide uh, in a rather comical way through music and point out to people uh, just how much head exploding is possible through music. And this is the this is the joke of of uh, Mars attacks, and actually it's a truth. I mean, it's I mean, this is this is the power of humor, and humor is another tool that, like music, can cut through a lot of the bullshit of people who take themselves too seriously, especially spiritually. Um. So. I want to tell you how this works in the Messiah game. Okay, now I've talked about how the Messiah game is a system. It's a repeating system. It operates at multiple levels. Uh, at the highest level, you have God incarnating and coming again and again and reincarnating in different forms and different cultures and different species and getting a taste of that culture, the art and science and worldview of that culture. And the idea of God's version of the game is to wake up and find a culture, a worldview, a milieu that God says, you know what, this is just right for me. Not for everybody. If you think God wants everybody to eat the same dog food, you don't know God. God is an individual soul, just like every other soul, has his own tastes, his own preferences. And uh, 
for better or worse, the Messiah grew up in a Christian environment. Likes Christian music, likes classical Christian music. Also likes some pop music, likes classic rock, classic jazz, jazz standards. That doesn't mean that you have to like those things too. But that does mean if you want to go bask in God's heaven, you better not be planning to sit around and listen to the music of harps, listen to rap, listen to Madonna croon on and on, or any of these other <laughs> kind of singers. God doesn't like that shit. That's why we have many heavens because not everybody needs the same God food. And music is one of the things that can drive you the craziest when you're stuck in an environment where somebody's forcing you to listen to music you don't like. That can be most one of the most painful things for a, a sensitive soul, an awakened soul, to deal with. And uh, boy, don't I know that. Um, then again, you can't just, well, you can just isolate yourself from it, which, uh, as anybody who's done that knows, greatly limits the number of people you can have relationships with. And this is kind of the, the darkness of pop music. Uh, pop music is designed to basically reduce humans, human incarnated souls, to a lowest common denominator. That's why they call it pop music. They play it over and over and over again till it drives more conscious souls away or it forms echo chambers. And that's why there's many genres of pop music. There's country and western. There's uh, rap, hip hop, etc., etc. These are all echo chambers of music that work just like the echo chambers of politics, of spirituality. They tell you that we're uniting you with with more universal music. That's not what they're doing. They're trying to dumb you down to a lowest, a lowest set of common denominators that create echo chambers that people are stuck in and rabidly defending. And I've seen this. I've seen these uh, products of these mega churches who have this, you know, pop Christian music as their standard who will rapidly attack the standards of Catholic music, the mass, the, the, the great masses of great composers, which should be performed. The great works of great Christian composers that are played in St. Paul's Cathedral. And, you know, I can tell you one of the greatest joys of my life was getting to spend time in England and in Europe and go to all the free concerts that are available there in big churches and small and listen to really glorious music. Not, not all of it was glorious. Some of it was stuff like you got going on in the background here. I don't know if you can hear it, but it doesn't speak to me. It, I've managed to find later 20th century classical music to be somewhat interesting and uh, enjoyable. Uh, the most appealing for me are uh, the works of folks like Mahler, Prokofiev, um, Benjamin Britten, to some extent. I, there are many modern composers I like, 
uh, Stravinsky, etc. Uh, there are many that are like, eh, I like Bartok sometimes. I like uh, uh, Shostakovich sometimes, and so forth. Um, I'm not too fond of John Williams, you know, the pop version, uh, Star Wars theme music, the, the pops concert stuff. Uh, I like Korngold. Uh, film film score composer, late romantic, who made his uh, living writing music for film scores back in the, the classic era of cinema, uh, before the transition to all color. Some of the best movies, in my opinion, were made in that era. But again, that's just my opinion. That's what my heaven would be like. And that's why the Messiah system works the way it does. Every soul is gradually getting an idea of what their heaven would be like. And through their experiences in this physical realm of testing and their experiences in the spiritual realms of fantasy, of Okay, well here's, here's what we think. This is how karma works actually. Karma measures your Merkaba after each incarnation and says, you know what, this is most resonant with this universe or maybe these, these handful of universes. So when you die, you have sort of choices laid before you and one choice or another will be more appealing might be a very dark place, might be. That's why some people report in near-death experiences, well, there was this darkness that felt so warm and, and uh, calm and attractive. And others will say, oh, there was this light that was all knowledge and all love, and I wanted to go towards that light. Okay, uh, this, these are advertising signs. Uh, they're based on karma. And they're also based on uh, factors that you may not be aware of because you don't know what your karma is. You may have uh, done things that you thought were perfectly right and, and just and what needed to be done that turned out to be you made a really big mistake there. And every soul does that. Even God has made big mistakes. Probably bigger than most any other soul that ever existed. That's why he became such a accomplished creator. Not the best creator, necessarily, but a very accomplished creator that had the brilliant idea uh, you know what, let's let everybody create because my ideas are not perfect. If you think any soul's ideas are perfect, you are a fool. If you think any music is perfect, you're a fool. You can always improve. You can always find something new that speaks to you in a better way for a certain mood. Do I listen to Mahler day and night? No! I suppose there are some people that do, that have a very narrow musical interest, and that's all they ever listen to. Okay, more power to them. Do I learn to love music that I hate? Sometimes. It can happen. Um, there was a time where I didn't have much exposure to anything but classical music and country music. Uh, and then I hit high school and people were listening to rock and roll and this and that. Actually it was maybe, you know, was it, yeah, be junior high, I guess. Uh, in the Boy Scouts, I was exposed to the music that my fellow scouts were listening to. And one of the older ones, who was kind of my mentor in the scout troop, Marty Trillhouse, if you're still out there. I love you, Marty. Uh, 
and your father. It was an interesting family. His father was an arch conservative like my dad. I mean, even worse, like John Birch Society kind of uh, my country right or wrong arch conservative American. But he was a really good guy. He did a good job of raising his son Marty. His Marty was kind. Of, his son was kind of a rebel. He listened to all the uh, avant-garde, uh, popular, semi-popular music. So like hard rock, I was introduced to through him. Um, Led Zeppelin, Chicago, um, a lot of Three Dog Night. That was a big one there. Uh, that. I might not have ever been exposed to because by then my oldest brother had gone on to college and become uh, part of the hippie movement in the uh, University of Washington in Seattle and uh, was kind of beginning his disconnection from reality that got him to the strange place he is now. At any rate, um, my musical influences I'm very thankful for. Um, and I'm even trying to learn the, learn to like some of the music my wife listens to. But I find it very banal and trite and uh, rather dark. I think music, popular music, took a real turn for the dark side in the 90s. Um, if you listen to pop music over the decades, uh, in the 90s, you had this shift of pop music being music that tried to make you happy, tried to make you feel better, tried to salve the wounds to music that basically tried to poke the wounds. It was very dark, nihilistic music that started coming out in the 90s. Uh, you know, that's basically when rap hit its hit its uh, stride, and this is very dark music. It's like, uh, everything in society sucks, so you just better go get what you want and, and be selfish and, and uh, don't care about anybody else. This is kind of the nature of rap. You know, rap the early rappers were all guys who uh, were pissed off at, at the world because uh, you know, women weren't falling all over themselves to give them sex, and, and uh, I don't know. The world started looking really crazy to me back in the 90s. Now, there were crazy aspects before that, but the counterculture was more healthy. The comedy was more healthy. Um, those of you familiar with my love of Monty Python, uh, we'll, we'll know that, that that to me is the last really healthy comedy that was out there. I'm not a big fan of stand-up comedy, at least not how it works now. It's dark and vulgar and uh, I've done stand-up comedy and actually been successful at it. I, I did my first stand-up comedy routine in Shanghai when I was there. Um, and I, I think I didn't bomb, which is, you know, quite a, quite a statement when you're, you're doing new material in a new city with a culture that you're not completely integrated with. I never became a normal expat in China. Uh, I was one of the really strange ones uh, who started a community theater poured all of his spare time and money into it uh, when he maybe should have been focusing on his expat assignment or uh, maybe taking more steps to defend the people he saw you know, being persecuted. I saw persecution firsthand in China. Yes, they do persecute minorities. I saw Tibetans persecuted. I saw Uyghurs persecuted. I saw even Han Chinese persecuted because they weren't from uh, the rich cities and they weren't playing the game the way that the, 
the rich and powerful want it in china and if you think china is anything but a very dystopian oligarchy even if they claim to be communist you're a damn fool and uh the draconian way that they try to program people with Chinese music, Chinese drama, Chinese this, Chinese that, especially since they realize, whoa, some of a lot of Chinese are starting to like Western stuff. For a while, they were very much encouraging, uh, especially among the elite, children to uh, learn to like Western classics, Western classical music, Western classical films. Those were easily available. Uh, like, for instance, there was uh, my favorite uh, bootleg DVD place was on this street that uh, probably doesn't exist. Any well, the street exists, but it's probably totally different now. There was a whole street in Shanghai that had literally 20 or 30 of the higher class DVD shops. Uh, now, you could buy DVDs on any street corner if you didn't mind getting Russian subtitles or German uh, audio uh, and wanted the latest films that were popular at the cheapest price. I wasn't concerned about having cheap. I wanted the stuff I wanted and it wasn't the popular stuff for the most part. I mean, you know, I was still in transition then. I wasn't fully awakened. There were things that I got I had in my DVD collection that uh, were like, why, why did I buy that? That is absolute trash. I can't even watch it anymore. But anyway, that's how we evolve, right? So I understand what other souls are going through. and But I also need to warn you that you are being programmed. Not only with your commercial programming, uh, streaming shows that you like to watch but also with your music and music is more effective programming because uh, basically you can think of popular music as uh, a beat which is like a carrier frequency they get you hooked on a certain beat a certain set of motifs and then they pile the lyrics on that giving you the programming, okay? And they will tell performers what lyrics they can and can't have in their songs. And if they don't conform, they don't change their songs to conform, their music will not be played. And this is something that any musician uh, through the last few decades has experienced. This is why the Beatles started their own record album and were trying to promote new groups that had messages that they thought needed to be heard but weren't being heard. And uh, if it had not been for the Beatles using their influence and their power to do that, there would have been many, many great songs of the era that would not have been heard. And there are some wonderful songs that were one-hit wonders that once they got out on, you know, uh, uh, avant-garde label, like the, 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 what the Beatles started out to, to make, but kind of went sour when they disconnected from what they were doing and let uh, Suits take it over and, and bastardize it. Um, there were some great songs there that had dual meanings. And if you start listening to music like that and say, okay, what is the surface message here? What's the deeper message? You will find that every bit of music has both. That's the magic of Mozart. All Mozart's music is spiritual. Even things like 
the magic flute, which people think of, you know, the average person who goes to see the magic flute probably is taking their kids there because they heard that it has monsters and, and uh, fairy tale kind of themes and have no idea that it is perhaps Mozart's most spiritual work. And the same thing with a lot of classic ho uh, Hollywood movies, a lot of classic Broadway musicals, Broadway shows. They, they can be played at different spiritual speeds. That's what makes them great. Uh, oh, the shows we put on in Shanghai were phenomenal. Um, I think I'm gonna end up talking a little bit more about my experience in Shanghai because China's a big part of this mess that's going on right now, this cultural morass. Because in fact, the dumbing down of humanity uh, is not just a commercial effort. It is a teamwork between commercialism, globalism, and communism. And this is why this is such a good topic, I think, to try to open minds to what's really going on. Okay? I've seen or been exposed to pretty much the last hundred years of cultural Marxism. And I, I call it also cult Marxism because it is basically the programming of people through culture. And sometimes it is counterculture and sometimes it is existing culture turned on its head. This is how good became bad. This is how hot became cool and hot again. And we don't know what, you know, when somebody says something is hot, you don't know that whether to feel insulted or complimented as a lady, right? Uh, so you have to call them cool. And that's sort of a neutral term that you know, isn't going to get you in trouble. This is insane what they've been doing to people with uh, cult Marxism. And it's, it, I mean, it's a natural part of cultural evolution. And it's going to happen. But it's been put on steroids in the last few decades. And that is a direct result of the work of the adversary. And there is a spiritual adversary, and that spiritual adversary hates humanity, wants to divide, destroy, or assimilate. This is the adversary's way, and those who play for the adversary, and they work through hive minds, creating social media echo chambers, music echo chambers, movie echo chambers, uh, cult followings of culture is how they are programming you to disconnect from your fellow human or to accept a forced connection through some fake unity that says, well, everybody should like this because that is spiritual music. And uh, ask anybody what spiritual music, and you know, a new age numpty dumpty will say, "Oh, it's binaural beats or these this gong crap from uh, uh, India or for or some shamanic music from South America." And they'll swear up and down that's the only way to enlightenment. It's nonsense. Spiritual stuff, anything is dual use technology. It can lift you up or it can enslave you. It can bring you down. And there's no one size fits all. That's why we needed to create a multiverse. And that's the idea that God had. That's the idea that earned God the capital G. Giving every soul a chance to find their place just right. 
their perfection, not being forced to live in somebody else's perfection, but a responsible perfection because if you get to your place just right and start forcing your perfection on everyone else, you become a dark god. You become a bad guy. You become a tyrant. And tyranny is the cardinal capital karmic sin, pushing your worldview on others instead of just defending it. There's a difference between defense and offense that I don't think many who are becoming polarized around the Israel-Hamas conflict get. You're being played for fools if you're advocating one side is perfect and the other side is the bad guys. There's, there are lots of bad guys on both sides and there's many more good guys who just want to have a decent life and get along together. Now, if you know the history of this conflict, you will know that when it started, everyone was pretty much getting along pretty well together. Uh, Jews had started relocating to the Middle East, to Palestine, long before the state of Israel ever existed. They were coming as refugees from persecution in World War I, and before World War I, and between the wars. And they were pretty much getting along with their neighbors in Palestine. When the militarism started was when Zionists decided, you know what, we've got to change the name of Palestine to Israel and we've got to make it a Jewish state. Now, why did they need to do that? Why couldn't it have just been uh, the shared holy land of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism? Don't call it Palestine. Let's, okay, let's change it from Palestine to Holy Land. Make the country Holy Land. Why did we have to call it Israel? Well, you could argue that all of the Abrahamic faiths are Israel. Many people don't know that Christians Jews and Muslims all have the Old Testament as scripture. And in fact, some groups and sects of them also include books that were removed from the Torah or have versions of the Torah that were older then the codified version that is accepted as gospel by the Jews. Uh, many of you may not be aware that the Torah itself was codified by scholars who were so worried about changes that they were seeing coming into the, the scriptures of the Hebrews that they put codes into it so that they could catch scribes who were committing cult Marxism on their scripture. That's proof that it had already been changed beyond recognition. It had already been bastardized from what the oldest prophets were trying to pass down. Sometimes by new prophets, sometimes by those who wanted to profit from religion, use it to cement their own power. Okay, and this is what cult Marxism is all about, is trying to establish a cult, a belief system that justifies a new power, makes that the one thing that everybody has to follow. That's what media is trying to do 
when they tell you, oh, you've got to watch this new series. Oh, you've got to listen to this new song from blah, 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 blah. And it becomes popular because you hear it all the time, all the time. Programming. If you're the kind of person who likes music more because you heard it 20 times, you need to question whether you are an NPC, a non-player character in the dimension of music. Music is you being used to be to program you and manipulate you. Or if you're the kind of person that could watch the same series that has to watch every new series that comes out and will re-watch them over and over again, the ones that you like, okay, that's because you have been programmed to love something. And you have to look at what that programming made you love. Women have been programmed to love stories that preach the new feminism. We don't need men. Except as sexual gratification tools and providers of stuff. This is the message that cult Marxism is giving you in most of the world today. The globalist message. And the feminine masculine divide is more of a commercial programming message designed to make you unhappy and depressed and want to buy more shit. <coughs> That's why social media has done the most damage to women and girls because they are the easiest to program to want more shit to make themselves feel better. And when you get a bunch of shit that doesn't make you feel better, that makes you depressed. And there is nobody with a half a brain that doesn't see the studies that have been done and conclude that social media causes depression among young people, especially young women. Causes sexual dysmorphia, causes all of the ills that have been multiplying generation after generation after generation for the last hundred years. This is the dark side, the weapon of mass destruction that's been blindsiding us all while we were afraid of a nuclear bomb. Humanity is bombing because of its culture far faster than it'll ever bomb itself because of its bombs. Or because of its climate. The culture war is a spiritual war and it's being fought with weapons of mass dispersion. Dividing us through music, dividing us through everything you can think of. And we need to stop doing that. There's no one-size-fits-all perfect music. There is God's music. It's not for everybody. That's why there are many versions of God who have created different heavens in their own preferred likeness. And this is how the game of souls works. This is how it was set up. When God existed as the first creator who realized, I am, what am I? What am I not? What I am not becomes God's children. This is how you create with thought and thought came before anything else. Guaranteed, proven. I don't care what numby gumby materialist says that chemistry creates thoughts. You're stupid, you're idiots. If you think 
thoughts are made in your brain, you're stupid. You're an idiot. Thoughts are made by your soul. Using information from your brain, your brain is a coprocessor. It's a filter to give your soul a narrowed experience of one incarnation vehicle. Because if you saw everything, and you sometimes do in a psychedelic experience, it's overwhelming. You cannot possibly grok this everything. And you need that filter to have some comfort. Uh, maybe it will help you to see, oh, there is more than, than, go, than meets the eye here. And that can be dangerous too, because many of the people who have these spiritual experiences of, oh, I've seen everything, I know everything now. Well, that's not true. <coughs> You're not in the mind of God. You're in the mind of Borg. The NPC generator who has all the sort of me too thoughts that souls have ever thought. The good ideas, the bad ideas, the things that didn't work, the things that failed miserably. That's what knowing that all is. That's not the mind of God. God doesn't want the bad thoughts. Doesn't want the thoughts he doesn't like. Neither does any other God. Borg is the only soul programmed to want to take all those dumb thoughts. That's why you feel this infinite love, because you really have to have unconditional love to want to take all the stupid thoughts of all the stupid souls that ever existed, all the Me Too thoughts from, you know, the Me Too's that uh, saw somebody else get a bunch of money because they lied about their relationship with the guy? Yes. Ladies, there are many among you who have me too your way into a nice settle divorce settlement that you did not deserve. And I'm talking to... Uh, particular one of my exes here who me tooed her away into destroying my life well it was part of the part of the plan if my my the final phase of my spiritual awakening wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had to go through those dark nights of the soul that doesn't mean I have to forgive and forget That does not mean that she is forgiven or forgotten. She's got karma, some very dark karma from what she decided to do to separate me from my daughter and to separate me from the retirement I'd worked so hard to have so I could focus on what I wanted to do. Well, I'm still doing it. I guess I'm, I'm here giving you my podcast, uh, wondering if I'll get to stay with my new family here in Indonesia, because uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get my new passport that my ex made it necessary for me to get in order to extend my spouse visa, uh, forcing me to pay the money that I did not owe her in child support because we had made an agreement that she didn't tell anybody about. She just said, oh, look, look, here's a, here's a support order and he didn't pay. And I've been extorted for uh, something on the order of $40,000 and uh, had the indignity of trying to settle this in court in Colorado and getting a uh, feminist judge who just sat on it. It took over a year to take the court case to court and instead of making a decision, the judge said, well, okay, I need to think about this one aspect for a little bit first. Uh, I'll set... Uh, 
A follow-up, three months later, that passes, nothing gets decided. There's some really dark karma committed against me and those people will suffer for what they've done. That's karma. I will not forgive them for the slings and arrows they have thrown at me. You don't have to forgive the people that screw you over. You do have to not blame everybody for the sins of a few. I don't blame all women for what a, what a few feminists and nasty women have done to me. But I'm almost done, babe. Give me a few more minutes. You want to show them your tits? <laughs> My wife. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, basically, you need to reevaluate what you're trying to force on others, what your priorities are, what you think your heaven is like, and make it fit into others. I'm not perfect. I made mistakes. I wasn't the perfect husband in any of my marriages, but I was a pretty damn good one. And I think my latest wife finally appreciates that and, and gives me a pass because I give her a pass on a lot of her weaknesses and dark sides. Uh, this is what we have to do if we want to live with others. If you're not willing to compromise on your dogma, your religion, your tastes, your culture, you need to be prepared to live alone. And ultimately, you'll have that opportunity in the loneliest universe that I could imagine. Because what happens if you can't learn to get along with other souls is you end up in your own private heaven surrounded by the NPCs that you created with your mind in your own virtual reality, completely isolated from any other soul. That's how it ends if you're that dogmatic, that you can, you'd rather live with robots programmed to think, act, and do like you want them to. If you have that power fantasy and you could be happy with that, that's what you're eventually going to get. I wouldn't recommend it. It's not very fun to be surrounded by yes men and yes women. And that's what megalomaniacs, those who want power, those who want it my way or the highway are going to get eventually in the afterlife. Reincarnation and karma are giving you different perspectives so you don't immediately choose a, a Pandora's box gift that you might be very disappointed with after you get there. You got to think really long and hard about where you want to spend eternity. Because the closer you get to making a decision of this is the heaven I want to stay in, the harder it is to be to, to, is going to be to escape. That's why gods and goddesses of different heavens are recruiting. That's why they're pulling so hard on your heartstrings trying to convince you to join the one. Because they know once, you, once they get you in, it's going to be hard to get out. You think it's hard to get out of a cult. In this physical universe, imagine how hard it is to get out of a universe that is built around a cult. And so I think that's a good place to leave it. Be sure of your cult sure. You might not get a chance to change the road you're on. And there's not much longer to decide because we are near the finish of a day of creation, a day of testing, of all souls, a testing of God, 
a testing of karma, a testing of Lucifer, of Lilith, of Borg. Every soul has had to be tested in this experiment to get to its finish. The best versions of the best souls and the also ran versions sent back to the abyss, to the board, to be recycled as non-player characters. Because we don't need a whole bunch of half-awakened NPCs anymore. We don't need a bunch of red-shirt fumbling idiots to beam down to a planet and get themselves killed and, and increase the danger level on the Starship Enterprise. Well, we need it somewhere maybe for those who are still playing that game. And that's a game that is going to be important in day eight of creation. Not everybody needs to play that game. The, the spiritual Star Trek game that's going to be happening in the prime universe, the universe of testing, Lucifer's universe is going to be moving into that phase of implementation, testing souls to see how useful they are to spread the good news to the places that are still under the boot of hive minds, of authoritarian rulers, and yes, most of the Galactic Federation are still very authoritarian in their handling of their planets. And they're still trying to conquer others' planets, stealthily or actively. It's not a peaceful world out there. The ETs are fighting just as much as we are. That's why some of them are crashing. One of the reasons, that's why they have relationships with different powers here, because they are using humans in their struggle. That's the nature of souls who are stuck in these power fantasies. They want to use and abuse anything they can to get what they want. Those aren't the smartest souls in the shed. If you see somebody who wants power, who is blinded by, oh, I know if I just had more power, I could, I could save the world. Those are dangerous people. Those are crazy people. They should not be your leaders. Yet, that seems to be who most want as a leader. You want your crazy people in, star in charge. And then you wonder why we come to the brink of, of world wars. <laughs> Wise up, humanity. Listen to some music instead of beat, beating war drums. Whatever you have to do to just say no to this nonsense. And it is nonsense. You're being played for useful idiots tyrants who want to use you. Not one tyranny, but many tyrannies because all of them want to be the godfather of the world or the, the chief representative of an off-world godfather, which is the way humanity has been used and abused before. Anyway, there's good news at the end of this all because the better souls are gonna get a better afterlife. And if they like you there well enough, they'll invite you to stay and you'll be in a place that's pretty good for you, hopefully. If it's not, uh, well, you chose poorly. You chose maybe a hive mind uh, that made uh, an offer you couldn't refuse. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. This nonsense of universal love, unconditional love, smothering love, 
is not probably going to be what you want. If you've changed your musical taste because you wanted to fit in and you started listening to this gong bullshit that they tell you is spiritual, these binaural beats nonsense they tell you is spiritual, uh, and, and you don't really like it, you're a useful idiot. You're being programmed. You're, 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 you're conforming to tyranny because you think it's going to be uplifting spiritually. At any rate, I, I think that's enough on this topic. I hope you found that useful. If you did, like, share, subscribe, comment, get involved, argue. I don't mind. I'd love to have someone prove me wrong about anything I post on this channel. Would absolutely love it because I would learn something from that. And I've changed my mind about a lot of things. I've learned a lot in a long lifetime. Many long lifetimes, in fact. Some that were so long, uh, I don't hope to ever live that long again. At any rate, till next time, this is Rob Trump for the Ominous Hour. Happy Karma.